Hello, and welcome back to New Scientist Weekly, your curated selection of the week's science stories. I'm Christy Taylor in New York. And I'm Timothy Revel, also in New York. This week, some extremes in outer space, from the biggest mass quakes to the oldest fast radio bursts. We'll also look at the changing epicenters of bird flu outbreaks, the world's tiniest particle accelerator, and why some engineers think we can run massive data centers at much, much hotter temperatures. But first, what if it were possible to communicate with people who were asleep? I can think of dozens of TV plots that involved cramming for tests by listening to tapes of the subject in your sleep, including in one episode of the TV show Dexter's Laboratory, an ill-fated attempt to do so with French. But new research has found actual evidence that it may be possible to at least evoke a reaction from people who are sleeping, at least a smile or a frown. So maybe we're still a few years away from learning in our sleep, but medical reporter Claire Wilson is here to explain why even this development is a big deal. Hey, Claire. Hey. So intriguing stuff, right? What was the team looking for in the first place? Yes. So it it is very kind of odd. And this was scientists trying to establish just a really kind of basic communication method with people who are sleeping. So they asked people to either smile or frown in response to hearing certain kinds of words. So did hearing these words wake them up? Or, you know, I mean, some people are rather light sleepers. Yeah, I am one. I, I'm sure I can't help feeling that it might have woken me up, but apparently <laughs> not. They played very quiet recordings of the words. In fact, the subjects were wearing monitors on their head that could monitor their brain waves, a kind of EEG. So the scientists could even see if the noises were, in fact, interfering with them falling asleep. And as people drifted off, the researchers just you know, adjusted the volume so that the words were only just audible. Got it. So how well did this work? Mm, Well, you could argue not very well. The volunteers did their smiles or frowns only some of the time. In fact, it ranged from only 5% of the time to 20%, depending on what stage of sleep they were in. But that was enough that it could be useful, the researchers say. And the funny thing is that the people had no memory of making these responses when they were questioned about it afterwards. It's pretty strange. It, it's sort of yeah. like the researchers are communicating directly with these people's subconscious and they don't even know about it because they yes. don't remember later. This, the smiles that they do when instructed by the researchers, how big are we talking on a scale of, say, Mona Lisa to Cheshire Cat? <laughs> yeah, that, I, I asked the researcher that too because I, I was very intrigued by that. So it's, it's more like a small twitch of the muscles. I Mm. was speaking with one of the team, uh, Delphine Oudiette at the Paris Brain Institute by Zoom. And so I asked her to show me the smiles and the frowns. And (laughs) they were really just kind of small twitches, but you could definitely see them. And the expressions were detected with electrical sensors on the person's face. And that means they could detect these brief twitches, plus it made the recording very accurate. Mm. So... Brief twitches that don't work quite a lot of the time. What is what is it they're actually hoping to achieve with this? Yeah, it's a fair question. I mean, first off, I think it's just really impressive that they had established any communication at all with people who are asleep when we previously would have assumed that mostly this is, you know, sleep is a kind of an altered state of consciousness when you're supposed to be cut off from the world. This kind of communication has previously only been established with people who are having lucid dreams. And if you didn't know lucid dreaming, that's when you're dreaming and you know you're dreaming and you can take control of your dreams, something I've always wanted to do but never have. Now, it seems that as far as we know, anyone can have these occasional periods during sleep when you can take in signals from the outside world and make signals back in return. At the moment, the researchers are most interested in in refining their methods. So they're hoping to detect signature changes in brainwaves when people are in these these special periods of communication. And the researchers call them windows, open windows of communication. And obviously that would make their experiments easier so they wouldn't waste so much time, you know, playing the recordings when the people have no hope of making a response. But in future, well, I mean, just wouldn't it be really cool to be able to ask someone questions while they're asleep? I mean, maybe we could ask people questions about their dreams. 
Maybe the answer, though, is let me please go back on to sleeping, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that does sound like a really cool way to research dreams, though. I mean, this is such an intriguing area of consciousness. Yes, and we, we still don't really know why we have dreams. There are lots of theories, but we don't know. But um, more seriously, the researchers say it could be relevant for helping people who have sleep disorders, things like sleepwalking, which actually can be quite dangerous. And there's another condition called paroxysmal insomnia. And that's when you're convinced that you don't sleep well at all. When you wake up, you feel like you've hardly slept a wink. But when these people have their sleep monitored in special laboratories, it, they actually are having a great night's sleep, but they just don't feel like they are. So Udiet speculates that maybe both these groups of people, uh, sleepwalkers and these people with paroxysmal insomnia, maybe they have windows that are too open. Next to the week in space, reporter Alex Wilkins is here to tell us about mysterious signals from the farthest reaches of the galaxy, and also about the largest ever quakes observed on Mars. Welcome back to the show, Alex. What can you tell us? So there's a, a few stories, as you mentioned. Um, if we start off in our own galactic neighbourhood on Mars, we found the source of its largest ever quake, which charmingly scientists call a Mars quake. Last year, NASA's InSight lander detected a enormous, for Mars, tremor, which they catchly named S1222A. Um, Not quite as was... charming as Mars quake, that, is it? I know, yeah, they need to work on their naming. Um but this quake was five times larger than the previous most powerful one. And the scientists who found it assumed that it was caused by something impacting Mars because the next two most powerful quakes, they found associated craters with them. So the logical thing seemed this one must have a crater as well. So, of course, they started hunting for craters. Yeah, I feel like you've really set us up here. We know where this is going. I'm guessing they didn't actually find a crater in this case. Yep, you guessed correctly. Um, so after scouring the surface of Mars using data from seven different missions from space agencies all over the world, from the US, China, India, Europe, the UAE, they came up with nothing. Now, if an impact had caused a Mars quake this big, the crater would have had to be between 300 and 500 metres in diameter with a blast zone probably 100 kilometres across. It's pretty much inconceivable that they would have missed it from all of these searches. So that really leaves only one other explanation which is the quake was coming from inside the house, that is, within Mars's crust. Spooky. And why did this happen, and what does this tell us about Mars as a quaking, seismically active body? So the Mars quake is probably the result of stresses that built up in Mars's crust over billions of years finally being released. A very relatable condition to anyone who's had the occasional breakdown. Um, <laughs> the, the Mars quake had particularly strong surface waves, which are the components of quakes that tend to cause the most damage. Now, understanding how these surface waves travel across Mars might shed some light on, on the really different sort of crust profiles in Mars. It, it has really significant differences between the northern and the southern hemisphere, and scientists don't really understand why. So maybe by understanding this quake, we might be able to work out that difference. Also, while the quake was small compared with Earth's largest earthquakes, it's really important to understand how frequent these events are and, and what exactly they do to the surface. Because if we ever do send astronauts to Mars, they'll need to be aware of these in, in case they damage their spacecraft. I mean, I definitely still wouldn't want to be standing on the ground where one of those hit. Uh, what's been happening further afield, though? Yeah, so in other superlative news, my colleague Chen Lai has just written a story about the oldest fast radio burst, which are these mysterious blasts of radio waves from space. We've detected dozens from Earth since they were first discovered in 2007, but this new one dates back 8 billion years, which is 3 billion years older than the one before it. And the researchers also noted that it had about three times as much energy as was expected, which works out at 30 times what the sun produces in a year, or enough power to microwave a bowl of popcorn twice the size of our sun, if that's useful for you. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is very useful. What a great stat. So they're big obviously. But can you remind us, what is it that makes fast radio bursts fast as opposed to slow? Yeah, so these things are really, really fast. They last just a fraction of a second usually. And because they're so short, we rarely catch the same burst more than once. So each one we find is a really lucky detection. Researchers think that they might be the result of highly magnetized neutron stars rotating in distant galaxies, things called magnetars, a neutron star being the very, very dense core of stars that have gone supernova. 
But whatever they are, researchers find them really interesting to study because they might tell us about the matter between galaxies. They're traveling such long distances that they encounter loads of stuff along the way. So the wavelengths when they reach us will have been distorted in a way that can tell us what's in between. So the particles that exist in intergalactic space and how uniformly distributed they are. All of this gives us a better picture of the early universe. Each week, we try to bring you some of the most fascinating news in science, medicine and technology. But we also ask hard questions like, is anything I do actually my own choice? Well, world-renowned biologist Robert Sapolsky addressed this question in our most recent episode of Culture Lab. So take a listen to that for just a real great meditation on why free will doesn't exist and also why that means we should reshape society completely, especially the criminal justice system, at least according to Sapolsky. Thanks also to our listener, Duncan, who calls this our most mind-blowing yet interview. But he also wonders if a society that doesn't believe in free will might also be one that resorts to eugenics and other human rights abuses as a result. If you're looking for something a little lighter, well, Dead Planet Society comes in next week like a wrecking ball to help us contemplate the worst of all possible worlds. I would pick Hat P7b. So that's a kind of Jupiter-sized planet. It's 2,000 plus degrees. There is winds that are several hundred or several thousand kilometers per hour. They probably have things like sapphire rain. It's a pretty terrible place to be at. Sapphire rain? That doesn't sound too terrible to me, to be honest. And if you're still hungry to learn, we have a great offer for free digital access to New Scientist. That's four weeks of unlimited access to everything in the New Scientist app and on our website for zero dollars and zero pounds. We'll have the link in, you guessed it, the show notes. All right, we're continuing our book giveaway with puzzle maestro Rob Easterway, author of the new New Scientist book, Head Scratchers, which is out this month. He's been giving us puzzles to try, and last week's was about a dartboard, and he wanted us to figure out the lowest score you could not get when throwing three darts. For everyone tearing their hair out over this one, here's the answer from Rob, who starts by explaining the one dart version of the problem. So starting with the single dart, the smallest score you can't get is 23. You can get all the numbers 1 to 20. You can get 21, which is three sevens. You can get 22, which is double 11. You can't get 23, which is a prime number. So that helps to explain why you can't. With three darts, well, it needs a bit of trial and error and everything else and playing around. But let me tell you that the answer is 163. You cannot get 163 with three darts. So there we are. However hard you try, the maths doesn't work. We asked you to send us your guesses. And thanks so much for all of you who did, especially Simon and Lolita. You got it right. You will all, however, be entered into a drawing to win a copy of the book, even if you weren't quite there this time. And we're now down to our final puzzle. And so this is your final chance to win a free copy of Head Scratchers. So all you've got to do is send us your guesses as to the answer to this. So here's Rob's clue for the week. Okay, this is a sort of genetics meets probability question. And it's about Farmer Giles, who has got a flock of rare breed sheep. And one of his sheep, a ewe, is called Lucy. And she's pregnant with twins. Now, the thing about sheep is they have non-identical, what's called fraternal twins. So it's like you've got two baby lambs that are completely independent of each other. They could be male or female. There's no correlation between the two. And there's a vet clinic has got a reliable new prenatal test that looks for fragments of Y chromosome in the womb. Don't worry about the technicalities, but it means (laughs) this test has come up positive, which says that at least we know at least one of the lambs will be male. But here's my question. What's the chance that one of them will be female? So we know at least one is male. What's the chance that one will be female? All right, then. You heard the question. Knowing that at least one of the two lambs is a male, what is the probability that one of the two lambs is female? Send us your answer by email to podcasts at newscientist.com for a chance of winning a copy of the book. That's podcasts, plural. And if you want to do a little extra credit, we'd still love to receive a little audio clip of you telling us your guess, which you can do using the voice memo or voice recorder app on your phone. Again, the email address is podcasts at newscientist.com. We'll reveal the answer next week. This is your last chance. So get that guess in. A record bird flu outbreak has been devastating both domesticated and wild bird populations across the globe since 2021. As well, over 100 million birds have succumbed to the virus or been called to slow the spread. 
Our health reporter Grace Wade is here to tell us a bit more about the origins of the outbreak, plus how avian influenza has been shifting geographically in recent years. Hey Grace, welcome back. Hi, thanks for having me. So based on past outbreaks, Grace, I was under the impression that this year's bird flu had originated in Asia, as it often does. But you recently covered the findings of a new study that suggests otherwise. What's happening? Right. So the study found that the bird flu virus currently circulating the globe actually originated in Europe and Africa, not Asia. This suggests that the epicenter of bird flu viruses, which has historically been Southeast Asia, like you said, is moving into other continents. That's so interesting. What compelled the researchers to look at this in the first place? You know, why why does it matter where a virus like this starts? Like you mentioned earlier, a record number of both domestic and wild birds have died from bird flu virus worldwide since 2021. And we know that a subtype of the virus called H5N1 is driving the current outbreak. This subtype was first detected in China in 1996 and largely stayed in Southeast Asia until 2005. That year, H5N1 infected birds across Africa, the Middle East, and Europe. But then it fell out of circulation as more infectious subtypes of bird flu virus took over. That's why scientists were somewhat surprised to see H5N1 reemerge in 2021, especially because it has caused such an unprecedented and large outbreak, the largest ever, in fact. Unlike previous bird flu outbreaks, which have primarily affected domesticated birds like poultry, the current outbreak has also devastated wild bird populations, especially in Europe. So researchers wanted to understand what, if anything, is different about H5N1 this time around. Yeah, go on. What did they find? What, what is different this time around? So after collecting data on the number, location, and genetic makeup of confirmed bird flu cases that occurred between 2005 and 2022, the researchers traced the H5N1 virus behind the current outbreaks to another subtype of the bird flu virus. This subtype, named H5N8, evolved in northern Africa and began circulating in wild European birds in 2019, where it subsequently evolved into the H5N1 virus that we're seeing today. That virus then spread in wild European birds for at least a year before causing widespread outbreaks in domestic and wild birds in other continents, including North America, Asia, and Africa. The way viruses are named and numbered and traced can be confusing, even to researchers. (laughs) But the takeaway here is that we're seeing a major change for this bird flu virus, since the epicenter of bird flu evolution has historically been Southeast Asia. Yeah, so the 2021 H5N1 virus has just this whole different origin story to the one that emerged in the 1990s. What can we take from this now knowing that the epicenter of the virus has shifted? So if the epicenter of bird flu viruses has shifted into other continents, as this study suggests, that would indicate we need to step up surveillance efforts in other regions where we haven't been as vigilant in the past. This is especially true for Africa, where bird flu surveillance infrastructure is lacking. Surveillance is critical for understanding which bird flu viruses are circulating and how they are evolving or migrating. This information can then guide vaccine development and efforts to curb bird flu transmission. So I've got to ask, is this a flu we can get? And even if so, is it something that can transmit easily? Always an important question. So right now, thankfully, bird flu cannot transmit between people. Humans only contract the virus by interacting with an infected animal. But each time that happens, it gives the virus an opportunity to evolve mutations that could help it spread in people. Surveillance allows us to identify places where the virus could spill over into humans and then subsequently warn people in that area about contact with wild animals who could potentially make them sick. Next up, a story about a device that is often huge, but now researchers have found a way to make very, very tiny. Carmela Padovich Callahan is here to talk about the world's tiniest particle accelerator and why it could have huge practical benefits in medical care. Hi, Carmela. Hi. So normally when I think of particle accelerators, I think of CERN's Large Hadron Collider, which is famously 27 kilometers long and the largest machine on the planet. So for the world's tiniest particle accelerator, how tiny are we actually talking? And also, could you just give us a quick reminder, what even is a particle accelerator? Yeah, so let's start Let's start there. So particle accelerators do exactly what you think they do. You put particles into them and they make those particles go faster and faster and faster, like hundreds of thousands of kilometers per second fast. And this accelerator really is very tiny. The researchers made several sizes ranging from 0.2 millimeters to 0.5 millimeters. So that's sort of the same thickness as a couple of sheets of paper stacked together, or maybe a few human hairs, 
or a 15th of the width of a single spaghetti. <laughs> Excellent. A uh, 15th of the width of a single spaghetti is a great comparison. I think we should do more pasta comparisons on the show. So spaghetti, that's obviously a lot smaller than other particle accelerators. How did they make this one just so small? Yeah, so this is like a real honey, I shrunk the accelerator type situation. And it has to do with what actually happens inside of a particle accelerator. Typically, the particles get faster and faster as they move through the accelerator because they interact with electromagnetic waves. So if you want to make your accelerator smaller, you need to make sure that the particles can sort of surf an electromagnetic wave with a very small wavelength. In this case, the researchers used light as their electromagnetic wave, and the wavelengths of light are small enough to fit into a very tiny structure that can then be used as an accelerator. So just so I'm, I'm right on this, in this accelerator, you shine regular visible light on particles to make them go faster. It's actually infrared light, so just a little bit longer in wavelength than visible red light. And it's still not quite as simple as just shining the light. You also need that light to interact with the particles in just the right way to not just make them faster, but also keep them bunched up together so they don't get lost or spread around as they're accelerating. The accelerator that I reported on looks like two parallel lines of these sort of microscopic silicon pillars. I think there are two microns each. And to run the accelerator, you inject the electrons on the side, sort of through the, the runway with the pillars on the sides, and you shine the light from the top. The light interacts with the pillars, which gives it just the right wave shape to push the electrons through, and they accelerate in these kind of bunches that are well controlled. This is so fascinating, and I just love the idea as a chronic multitasker of being able to walk around accelerating particles in one hand and drinking a coffee in the other. <laughs> Uh, but what what could it actually be useful for? The most exciting use for, for such sort of tiny light-powered device would be in medicine. We already use beams of fast particles as part of some cancer therapies, and they always require a whole medical accelerator facility, which is expensive and takes space, and you have to build it from scratch. But as one researcher told me, this new tiny device could fit into the tip of a pen or even be directly printed at the end of an optical fiber, which would make it a lot more convenient and easy to use. It would give medical professionals more control as to where they want the particles to go in the body in addition to just being something you can hold in your hand, just like you suggested. There could be other uses too, like feeding electrons into some other device, maybe even device that would use them to create another kind of light, like quantum light, for novel communication techniques. So I guess what I want to know is, when should we be expecting to see doctors walking around with these little tiny particle accelerators tucked into their lab coat pockets? Right. I mean, it's it's very hard to predict the timeline for a technology to become fully practical, but the current version of this small accelerator still needs some improvements. For one, the electrons that come out are nowhere near as energetic as what you would get in one of these very large conventional kilometer-sized accelerators. But the researchers also told me that the idea of using light in these devices has been kicking around since the 1960s, and it just took a long time to iron out the details, and now they have. They have a working device, so adjusting it further seems less daunting, and they all say they're quite excited about what they can do to tweak it going forward. Awesome. I, I like the idea of just having it in your pocket. It's like, pew, 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 pew. You get particles. You get particles. <laughs> Tim, we've also had other news of interest this week, starting with some good news for the environment. You know how these massive server farms or data centers that run our internet and artificial intelligence and sometimes cryptocurrency mining are such major users of energy? Yeah, I get a big part in because of the cooling that they use to stop them from overheating. Right. Well, what if we could run servers at a lot hotter temperatures than we previously thought? I'm listening. That's the question posed by new research from a team in Hong Kong. Currently, the standard temperature range for a data center is between 20 and 25 degrees Celsius. That's a nice, balmy 68 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit. But they concluded that if servers could be designed to work well at 40 Celsius, which is a whopping 104 Fahrenheit, it could save many, many data centers from having to do any cooling at all and reduce energy usage by more than half for those in the warmest locations. Yeah, but I mean, just... Don't call the service. Why didn't anyone think of that before? Is there a reason to think this could actually work? Yeah, the team addresses this too. 
while older servers definitely do melt down at those higher temperatures, they are observing that we have naturally been developing servers with greater heat tolerances. And there are many newer models that already can operate at that 40 degrees Celsius or even 45, which is 113 Fahrenheit. I frankly almost don't believe that. And as a team of engineers, they took a look at outdated operating standards and recommendations as a big target for change. Basically, if more people operating server farms understood their equipment's actual limitations, maybe we could start raising the thermostat beyond the conventional wisdom. Knowing is essentially half the battle here. Fair enough. I want to take us back to sleep science for a moment. So earlier we had that story about how researchers may have found a way to communicate with people who are asleep. But what about that classic means of communicating with sleepers, the alarm clock? <laughs> well, a new study has found signs that you may not, in fact, wind up sleepier if you hit snooze a few times before getting up. That's really interesting because I definitely really avoid hitting a snooze as much as I can. I'm always worried about entering like the wrong phase of sleep at the wrong time. How do we know for sure that this is actually good, though? Yeah, I feel like I get a bit groggy if I've hit snooze a few times, but maybe that's just, in my mind, not actually happening. So this was a study of uh, people they call chronic snoozers, which are those who habitually hit snooze at least twice a week, which to me does not sound like that much. I sometimes <laughs> hit it twice a day. The team had these chronic snoozers sleep two nights in a sleep lab, one night without hitting snooze, and then another night where they were instructed to set the alarm half an hour earlier and hit snooze a few times. Then the researchers measured their cognition, mood, cortisol levels, and asked how sleepy they felt. And while the researchers observed a sort of small degradation in sleep quality on the snooze-heavy night, as well as very slightly higher levels of cortisol, there was actually no other appreciable difference. Now, Tim, you said this was a study of chronic snoozers, not the people who never hit snooze, who I'm sure exist. Could being used to hitting snooze affect how well it works for people? Yeah, maybe. And that's one of the things the researchers say could affect their results. But they did do another bit of research, too, just to try and figure out how common these chronic snoozers are in society. And it turns out about 70% of people they surveyed are so-called chronic snoozers. So the odds are that even if this is only true about people who are already in the habit of getting an extra 10 minutes of sleep every now and again, that's a lot of people that this finding would apply to. All right. All right. OK, I've got one for the poop files. It's about using dung beetles to help keep track of highly endangered lemurs. Ah, uh, yeah, those beetles that famously eat and raise their young in feces. Look, beetles don't tell us how to raise human kids, Tim. <laughs> if you're a dung beetle on the island of Madagascar, your diet is actually mostly poop from cows and humans. But researchers wanted to know if they could find evidence of lemur poop in the guts of beetles. So they set a bunch of little traps, collected dozens of beetles, and sequenced the DNA in their digestive tracts. As you do. Did they find anything? They did. They found DNA from six different lemur species in the recently consumed poop inside trapped beetles, including the critically endangered diadem chifaka. And they're excited about the possibility that they will be able to use this technique much more cheaply than camera traps or, you know, just walking around looking for lemur poo. And this could be used to detect not just the presence of specific endangered lemurs, but also their approximate density or even historical populations, since there are many dung beetle specimens just sitting in museums, theoretically full of dung and DNA. That's it for this week. Thanks so much for listening. You can find all the great journalism we talked about today in the show notes. And you could subscribe to this podcast on whichever app you're listening on. And of course, as always, if you like the stories we're bringing you from the serious to the silly to the poop files, please give us a rating or review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. We'll be back next week. Bye for now. Bye. This podcast is produced by OG Podcasts. Find out more at ogpodcasts.co.uk. Okay, I've got one for the poop files. Mm. It's... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, wrong reaction. <laughs> mm, delicious. Delicious. <laughs>